Welcome to Glory Stories with Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn was one of the top eye surgeons in America and has traveled to many countries in the world preaching the Word of God. She also opened up an eye surgery center in Beijing, China, where she did free eye surgery on those in need. Dr. Vaughn will be sharing many of her personal experiences from God. In addition, you will hear of others that have known God in an intimate way and seen His miracle working power. As you hear about how God has worked in the lives of others, our hope is that you will be changed forever. Get ready for God to heal you, deliver you, and transform your life as you sit back and enjoy these glory stories. Welcome to Glory Stories. I'm going to share with you today a great revival that started in America around 1906 with a man who only had one eye, but he had such a passion to know God in a more intimate way. Actually, he spent five hours a day for two and a half years every day praying to God, seeking God, trying to draw closer to God. There was a man named Charles Parham who came to Houston. That's where Seymour was, was in Houston, Texas. Charles Parham came there to start a Bible school, and he, he had become familiar with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which was very unusual at that point in time. And Seymour was hungry to know more about that. He wanted to more, be more, know more about God in every way he could. So he sat outside the room where Parham was teaching about the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and he learned all about it. And about that time, there was a, a, a church in Los Angeles area that contacted Seymour and asked him to come be their pastor. So he prayed about it, and he felt like that was what God wanted him to do. So he leaves Houston. He goes to Los Angeles, and when he gets there, he goes to this church and begins preaching about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Well, they weren't too happy about that in that particular congregation, and so it wasn't long until they put a padlock on the door. He came that night to preach in church, and the door was padlocked, and he was, he was not welcome in that church anymore. So there he was in Los Angeles, and now he didn't have a church anymore. But there were some people in that church that had compassion on him and said, well, you can come stay in our home and you can start a, a prayer meeting in our home. So he did. And the Spirit of God was so powerful there. Such wonderful things happened. I remember one lady who didn't know how to play the piano at all. Uh, one night she sat down to the piano and started playing and singing the piano just like she'd had lessons all of her life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, those are phenomenal miracles that God just does. And so things started happening. Things started happening, and people got wind of it. More people started coming to this home, and pretty soon there were crowds out in the, in the front yard and even into the sidewalks, and the authorities said, you can't continue having these meetings here because you're far too big to stay here anymore. Well, Seymour was still seeking more of God, and he asked the Lord one day, he said, what can I do to seek you in a more fervent way? And God said, pray more. Well, remember, he's already praying five hours a day. So he ups his prayer time to seven hours a day. Do you know anybody else that's praying seven hours a day? <laughs> I don't. Anyway, that's what Seymour did. And so Seymour starts asking the Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do? You're gonna, and they said, you're going to have to find another place. So he starts looking for another place to have meetings. And he found an old warehouse, which had also been a, a stable and that was for rent. He thought he might be able to make that into a facility that was adequate, but he didn't have the money to rent it. So he asked the Lord, Lord, what should I do? I need the money to rent this facility. The Lord said, get on a streetcar, go to Pasadena. So that night he got on a streetcar. He headed to Pasadena. He, of course, he didn't know where he was going. He had no idea, but he was obeying the Lord one step at a time. He got on the streetcar headed to Pasadena, and when he got to the right place, the Lord told him, he said, get off the streetcar here. He directed him to go to some apartments that were nearby and to go to a certain apartment door. Now, what he didn't know was inside that apartment door was a, a small group of women that had been praying for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. One of them had it, a lady named Sister Carney had the baptism already, but the rest of them were praying for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And they were, that day they had spent many hours praying specifically for revival. So he knocks on the door. He doesn't know what's inside. He knocks on the door. Of course, these women, it's now 1030 at night. 
somebody knocking on your door, they all go to the door at the same time. It's kind of scary. They go to the door all together. They open the door, and here's this man standing here. He said, you've been praying for revival, haven't you? They said, well, yes, we have. He said, I'm the man that God sent to preach the revival. So they ask him to come in. He comes in. He preaches to them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, about revival. He preaches to them there in that apartment that night. Then he takes up an offering, and the amount of offering that he got was enough to pay the rent on Azusa Street. So he rents Azusa Street. Of course, having, having been a stable, you know what stables have in them. Uh, Sister Carney, who went with him uh, and helped in Azusa Street, she said how grateful she was that Seymour had assigned her to the area to clean up where there were small goats instead of the area where the large cattle and horses were. So her cleanup job in the stable was a little easier than some other people. She was grateful for that. So they cleaned it all out, and they began meetings there in April of 1906. Now I want to read you something that kind of describes what a typical meeting would be like. In Azusa Street, the beginning of one of the greatest revivals the world has ever known. The meetings were spontaneous with no prearranged order, no special singing, no well-known evangelists, no collections, no advertisements, no church organization backing them. Now, have you ever been to a church like that before? Mm, probably not. Probably not. The Holy Ghost was in control. Seymour was the leader. He spent most of his time behind the pulpit with his head in a box praying and waiting on the Lord. Did you hear that? With his head in a box praying, praying in tongues and waiting on the Lord to tell him what to do, what to say. God began to manifest his power, and the meeting would continue all day long and into the night. When well-dressed preachers came in to, quote, investigate, conviction, conviction would soon fall on them, and they'd soon, soon be wallowing on the floor asking God to forgive them. In a typical service, someone would be talking, and suddenly the Spirit would fall on the congregation. God himself would give the altar call, Men would fall all over the house like the slain in battle or rush to the altar to seek God. The building was always full of people praying and services usually began mid-morning and continued till about 3 or 4 a.m. Did you hear that? Started mid-morning, continued to 3 or 4 a.m. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I have some more I want to read to you again in a little while, but right now I'm going to stop right there. Because so many miracles happened in Azusa Street, and I wanted to tell you about some of those. As we already read, when the meetings would start, Seymour would come out, and he would put this box over his head, and he would simply pray and wait on God. Many people with all kinds of problems would come. So thousands and thousands of people would come from everywhere, actually everywhere in the world, because people that were hungry for God would flock to wherever revival was going on, and revival was definitely going on in Razusa Street. So I'm going to tell you of a few of the things that happened. In one instance, there was a, a young boy. His parents carried him in because he had had a, a, a brain hemorrhage, and he couldn't, he couldn't even think or understand or move, or he just was like a, kind of like a vegetable from the brain hemorrhage. And he came there for prayer. And one of the young men, I think the young man was uh, one of the musicians. That, 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 uh, there, was an, there was a man who played the piano, and there was a violinist that came along with time. And one of those men prayed for this young man with a brain hemorrhage, and God immediately, he'd had the brain hemorrhage like four or five years before that. Immediately, this whole, everything that was wrong with him, God healed it spontaneously, immediately. And he got up and he just, just started running around and praising God that he was now well. That's the kind of thing that happened routinely, every day, not just once a day, but all kinds of miracles, all day, every day. Another thing that happened was uh, there was a particular man there named Bill Brown who who loved to pray for people with eye problems. And so he prayed for like over 50 people that were blind people and could suddenly see by the power of God. Uh, when they asked him, could he remember a special, a special one that meant something special to him, he recounted a woman that came in with, she didn't, even, she didn't have any whites to her eyes. She was totally blind and her eyes were just black. The whites never had developed. And when he prayed for her, God spontaneously 
healed her eyes, gave her whites to the eyes, and she could see. And the reason he remembered her is because she screamed, because she'd never seen anything before in her life. And now she could see everything and light and people. And she was so shocked by seeing the world that she screamed, and it scared him. It scared him, and so he, re he remembered that woman because she scared him. But over and over things like that happened. Even when that man was an elderly man and he was in a retirement home and Azusa Street was long gone, he still had this gift of, of praying for people that had blind eyes. So one day they brought to him an older woman who had blindness in her eyes. She had one of those canes, you know, that blind people have. They tap along the sidewalk or wherever and they go. And, and he took the first thing he did, he took that cane and he broke it in half. Now, does that tell you that he's expecting the woman to see? To me, that's a real strong sign of faith when you take the lady's cane and you break it in half before you even pray. He took her glasses off, dark glasses. He prays the prayer of faith for the woman, and Jesus makes the woman see instantly, spontaneously, beautifully. So he had that to follow to him a gift all of his life. There's another man named Fox, and he had a particular interest in ears, and he would go to a deaf person, and he would just whisper in their ear, and he would say, uh, spirit of deafness, leave this person now in Jesus' name. And, the, and he would hear like a, a whisk, a whoosh kind of a sound or a popping sound, and that would indicate to him that that spirit of deafness was gone and the person could hear. And this happened over and over. He was only 18 years old when he came to Azusa Street, and he came there because he wanted to prepare for a missionary, uh, a life of being a missionary in, in India. Uh, one day, a man who was the teacher of a, of a sign language class, you know, sign language for people that are deaf, you know what I'm talking about, sign language, he brought 35 of his students to Azusa Street. So Fox sees these 35 deaf people, and he says, you know, why did you bring them here? He said, you're going to be out of a job because they won't need to know sign language when God finishes with him and, and the, the instructor says, you're, you're talking like you think every one of these persons is going to be healed and made to hear. And Fox says, yes, I expect that to happen. So he had them all stand in a circle and, and join hands. Remember, they're deaf. All of them are deaf. He goes to the first person in the circle. He whispers in their ear, you deaf spirit, I command you in Jesus' name, leave this person now. Person's the deaf spirit leaves, the person can hear. The other people in the circle see that this man can now hear, and they all get excited, and that healing virtue of Jesus starts going through every one of those people in the circle, and they all start. He didn't have to pray for another one of them. It went through the whole circle, circle and all 35 of them all received their healing all at the same time. Guess what happened to their instructor? He didn't have a job anymore. God healed every single one of the deaf people that he brought that day to the meeting. So another time, a lady came in. She was crying and screaming with pain, and she had a bloody towel over, one, over her ear. And they didn't know what had happened to this woman. And, and so one of the ladies came, and she took the towel down, and there was no ear. There was no ear. It was just bloody, a bloody mess right there. No ear, you know, external ear. So she, she says, what in the world happened to you? You have no ear. She said that she came home, huh, people, some kind of people. She came home and she found another woman in bed with her husband. And so the woman in bed starts fighting with the wife. This was the wife that came in like this. She starts fighting with the wife and she bites the woman's ear off. She bites the wife's ear off. So... The person at Azusa Street says, did you bring your ear with you? She says, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. I just came straight here. So the woman at Azusa Street puts her hand over this bloody mess and prays and asks God to give this woman a new ear. And when she takes her hand away, there's a brand new ear there that God grew, just like this, a brand new ear. I'm giving you some examples of the kind of miracles that God did at Azusa Street. And you know what? Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same Jesus that gave that lady an ear, the same Jesus that made 35 deaf people here at the same time, he's here today, and he's ready and able to do the same for you. He is alive. 
Yes, they crucified Jesus, but he res was resurrected from the dead, and he is alive today. He was alive as Azusa Street doing that. He's alive today there for you. So if you cry out to Jesus, no matter what physical infirmity you have, he has ears to hear you. He's waiting for you to cry out his name and to ask him, believing him, that what you ask for, you will get, just like the people that came to Azusa Street. What they came for, they got it from the Lord. He's there, able to do that for you, and wants to do that for you today. Well, another time, a lady came in, and, and she had a great, huge mess hanging off the side of her face, the size of a half of a basketball is the way they described it. And she was holding it. She was holding it with her hand, and she had a child with her. And she came there because it was hopeless. The doctors had told her it was way too big for them to try to take it off surgically. So she decided to come to Azusa Street. So she's holding this great mess off of her face and, and ask for someone to pray for her. And they, so they pray that God will take this mess away. And just in front of all their eyes, it just, it just, it just dissolves. It goes away. This huge mess, it just goes away. goes away. How about that? Many wonderful things happen. Now, sometimes, not all the time, but on special, at special times, there would be fire that would shoot up from the ceiling of the Azusa Street building. There would be fire that would shoot down from heaven, and, and they would meet in the air, and the fire department would get called because there's fire. they thought there's really fire in Azusa Street. The fire, firemen would come. They'd come rushing in with all their paraphernalia on. There would be no flames anywhere. There would be no smoke anywhere. But yet, they, you know, you could go outside, and lots of the men went outside and looked, and there were, there were, you could see it. There were flames shooting up from the, seal, from the roof of the building and, and flames shooting down from heaven and meeting in the middle. It was a supernatural phenomenon. But when that did happen, the miracles in Azusa Street were augmented. They were greater. They were more astonishing than all the ones I've already told you about. When the fire was shooting, two things that happened that I recall when the fire was shooting, one was a man that was there who had had an industrial accident and his entire arm had been removed. He had no arm whatsoever. Now, back in those days, we're talking 1906, 1907, they didn't have good prosthesis, so whatever he had was just hanging there, useless to him. And Seymour was there, and, and he asked the men, can you, can you work? Can you support your family? He said, well, I really can't do much work with just one hand, and I just do the best I can, and we're barely getting along. And so Seymour says, well, God can solve that for you. He, he can solve that. And so Seymour prays that God will give this man a new arm, and they're all standing there, and they watch with their eyes, not, not just Seymour alone watching, but a, you know, a group of people there watching this. As the bone begins to grow out of the shoulder socket, and behind the bone starts to grow flesh behind that, muscles, skin, tendons, everything, the whole arm con continues to grow and grow, and then they watch, the hand grows, the fingers grow out, fingernails grow out, and he has a perfectly normal, 100% normal arm and hand just like the other arm. This happened while the fire was shooting out of Azusa Street. Uh, phenomenal. Another man was there also at a time when the fire was happening, and this man had been a, a chronic smoker. He had a cigar that he always just kept in the side of his mouth for years and years and years. He kept that cigar in the side of his mouth. With time, that cigar had caused cancer in the tissue, and the cancer had eaten off a lot of his cheek, his jaw, his lips, had eaten into his gums and his teeth, and he had basically a great big hole in the side of his face with all of those parts of his anatomy missing. While the fire was shooting, they prayed for this man, and God created all new teeth in there, all new gums in there, a new cheek, new lips, and the whole side of the man's face was completely healed of cancer. It was like black and rotting flesh and cancerous, and God just healed it and made it perfect, made it perfect. There was... There was one lady named Sister Carney. She's the one that was in the apartment that helped provide the original funds for Azusa Street. She, was, she specialized in people that were in wheelchairs. 
So the, she would always, when, they saw, when she saw someone in a wheelchair, she would go to the wheelchair, she would take the, the uh, foot plates of the wheelchair and lift them up and put their feet on the floor. This is when they were still paralyzed, put their feet on the floor. And then she would pray for them because she knew that God was going to heal them and they were going to walk and that those foot plates would be in the way. So she got them out of the way in, in the very beginning. And then she would pray and then the people would stand up and they would walk. Uh, this happened to everybody she ever prayed for in a wheelchair. And of course, the other people at Azusa Street, they saw her always lifting the foot pedal. So when they prayed with someone in a wheelchair, they too would lift the foot pedal. They call it the carny rule, that you always had to lift the foot pedals before you prayed for someone that was in a wheelchair. So many people got healed from wheelchairs. Now, on occasion, when Seymour had the box over his head, and he'd been praying sometimes for a short period, sometimes for an hour or more than an hour with a box on his head. And when he heard from God and he took off the box, sometime he would speak to a, an area that had cots that were brought from the hospital, people that were in terminal stages of diseases that were dying that had to be carried in on, on cots, other people in wheelchairs. And Seymour would say something like this, every one of you that's on a cot or in a wheelchair, you stand up now and take your bed and just go on home because you're healed in Jesus' name. And the whole section that was in Azusa Street that were in cots and wheelchairs would all rise up and they would all be well and they would all go home wherever they went. They would all leave well, completely healed by the power of God. So you see why I say that this was one of the strongest revivals and most amazing, miraculous revivals that the world had ever seen. Uh, in fact, a lot of people that ended up being well-known, like John G. Lake, we'll talk about him later, but it was advised that he go to Azusa Street and others like him that wanted to be in full-time ministry, that they go to Azusa Street and, 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 and try to you know, acquire that anointing that was there so that they could go on with the, with the ministry that they had. Uh, something very interesting happened. In the fall of, of 1909, Seymour stopped taking that box off, uh, putting the box on his head. He stopped doing that. Simultaneous with that, Azusa Street pretty much dwindled, dwindled down and the flame of the fire of Azusa Street started dwindling down. And, but three people made a prophecy around the end of 2009, the beginning of 2010. They made a prophecy in different parts of the United States. And keep in mind, this is a time when you didn't have cell phones and communication. Uh, if you were on the East Coast, you didn't know what the West Coast was doing or vice versa. You had, you had no way of instant communication. So Seymour stood up. And on more than one occasion, he, he prophesied that in about 100 years, there would, re, there would be a revival that would be greater than the day of Pentecost, that would be greater than Azusa Street. And this revival would just not be in one place, though. It would be in many places. It would break out in many places worldwide. And that it would even continue, the revival would continue until the return of Jesus Christ. Powerful in about 100 years. Remember, that was around uh, 1910. Simultaneous with this, on the East Coast in New York was Charles Parham. And he stood up there and he gave a prophetic word that was essentially the same as what Seymour had said in Los Angeles. And about this same time, Maria Woodworth Eder, which is another famous servant of God, and I'll tell you about her later too, but Maria Woodworth Eder stood up in San Diego, I believe, where she was, and she gave the a similar, you know, saying the same thing, prophetic word, about a greater revival would break out. It would be greater than Azusa Street, be greater than the day of Pentecost. It would break out in places all over the world, not just one place, and it would last until the coming of Jesus Christ. So in this day that we're living in now, this is a approximately a hundred years after those prophetic words were given. So we, we're, we're looking for that. We're waiting for that. We're expecting that, really. We're expecting 
you know, God spoke to me a long time ago, and he said, he said the word groundswell. I had to go look up what groundswell meant. And that's been so many years ago. I don't know if I can remember exactly what Webster said, but it said something like there was a swelling, uh, a, a, a tumult in the sea, and it would cause waves to come up. Now, you know, now we would just call it a tsunami. Okay, let's just say a tsunami. And I saw a tsunami of the Holy Spirit that would hit America and cross America. I'm sure it'll go in other countries too, but a tsunami of the Holy Spirit. Because really in this day and time, with the world situation like it is, I'm telling you the truth. There's no world power that's gonna be the answer. There's no president of a country that's gonna be the answer. There's no great person that's gonna be the answer. The only answer is going to be Jesus Christ. The only answer is going to be God Almighty sending a great tsunami, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not only across America, but across the other nations that are in turmoil, turmoil, total disruption and turmoil and darkness. Nothing short of the powerful move of God is gonna bring light into that dark, the dark areas of the world. Nothing, nothing. You wanna hear the truth? I'm telling you the truth. There's nothing but God. So if you, have, if you have any sense at all, you should run. You, I'm talking to you. You should run to the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ today. You should ask him to forgive you for whatever sins you have in your life. It's called repenting. You repent. It means that you, you are sorry that you did those sins. It means you're going to make an about face. And instead of heading in the wrong direction, you turn around and you head in the right direction, in the direction toward God and godliness. You begin to read your Bible. You begin to pray. Praying, what is praying? Praying is simply talking to God, just like you'd talk to your friend or your family member. You simply talk to God, and you know what? He wants to talk back to you. He wants to talk back to you. And then don't neglect assembling of yourselves together with other Christians, because the fire of one Christian keeps the fire of another Christian hot. You don't want to be isolated if you can possibly avoid it. So if you'll make that repentance today and take Jesus as your Savior, you will be on the, on the right road that's going to head you to heaven. When your day comes, you'll be headed toward heaven, and God will have a mansion up there for you. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, no more tears. And the people that have gone before you, that have loved the Lord, they'll be up there to meet you, and you'll recognize them. You'll know your whoever, your friends, your parents. We look forward to seeing you there. We hope that you enjoyed these stories of the glory of God. We believe that each story we tell will help build your faith and help to bring a miracle into your life. For more information about this program and Dr. Elizabeth Bond, Visit her website at GodsInstrument.com, her YouTube channel at Glory Stories Now, or write her at Elizabeth Vaughn Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 454, Argyle, Texas, 76226, USA.